Uh, this week, we're really excited to have Murray Perrell in some works with us. Murray is founder and architect of Doing the Works, which has offices in both Glasgow and London. Sort of. Sort of. In fact, this is interesting work in a wide range of scales and psychologies and is interested in architectural interests in the understanding of place. Since its inception in 2011, the fact has won a number of awards, including the Grand Designs Home of the Year Award for their I'm not going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> At the RID National Award. Further closing to our projects. I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, when I was studying at the Mac in Glasgow and then the Bartlett um, in London, lectures looked like these were always a highlight of the week. Um, I got to see some of my heroes talking, but um, I kind of sometimes left feeling that they hadn't always exposed. Um, what it really means to be an architect. Um, studying and working are two very different worlds. So I'm going to try and chip away a little bit um, at things and throw you and show that through some of our work. So denizen works have a broad range um, of projects in various locations uh, around the, the, the UK and beyond, including an, a farmhouse outside of Toulouse, um, where I came across this drink uh, for the first time. Um, does anyone know what it is? Um, no, okay. Um, took me some time to work out how they got the pear in there. Um, but if I teach you one thing this evening, um, that's, then it's about the spatial complexity of Poir Williams. Um, and if I manage to do that, I think this evening will have been a success. So for the past couple of days, um, Andrew Ingham and I, who's Dennis and Works other director, um, have been on site just outside Boat of Garton, uh, looking at site for this project, which um, our client would like to turn into an award-winning house um, uh, that also doubles as a, a film set for TV and film. Um, and all that comes about from the central building, which is just a very simple, handsome farmhouse. Oh, sorry, hold on a second. Uh, so the, the house is a rich history as a place uh, for Cayleys, not in the sense that's commonly used now, um, that of dance, but as a meeting house for telling stories playing music and fostering a sense of community. This option, uh, we've developed three options with this scheme, um, but this one shows the farmhouse with the, the addition of a drone store, office, the a new house and a beacon to guide the community up the hill to the house and the good times stored within. Sticking with the romance of Rundown Farm, this is the site of a new dwelling for two artists where we're bringing um, a new lease of life into these agricultural structures through the peeling back of uh, the history of the site to create a large um, covered outdoor living space uh, under this big cat slide roof. And the project actually involves the grafting uh, of new living accommodation a studio and a folly that will sit within this courtyard garden into these structures to create a group of buildings that is suitable for 21st century architect, uh, artistic endeavour. Now, the first three slides are examples of projects that are easy to love. And don't get me wrong, we are getting paid for them, but they're, they're ones that inevitably will be led by our hearts as we try to create the most poetic architecture in those dramatic settings. Sometimes, though, um, architects need to eat, and that's particularly true after the couple of years that everyone's had. Um, and it, this is an example of one such project, which is still very creative and enjoyable, but we're working with a London-based um, developer to help to develop this and other small housing projects through our Revit and technical design capabilities. So this is less design exercise and more technical. And I, I, this is just an example really to show you that um, some projects are less about design and more about other skill sets, but they're equally important um, 
to kind of go together and help uh, the running of a successful office. So I've described a bit about what we're working on at the moment, um, but I thought it'd be uh, useful if I explained a little bit about our office um, and the approach that we take to our work. First off, our name. So as you can see, a denizen is a plant naturalised on foreign soil. And in the context of architecture, this means to us anyway, any, a building or addition to a landscape that will be initially alien to its setting, but over time, when designed well, will become a cherished part of the local community or setting. Oh, in a bit trigger happy here. Um, and it, we don't describe ourselves only as architects, as we dine in architecture, but also installations, furniture, lighting, and more abstract ideas. So it's important that we project this skill set. The one slight contradiction, I think, to all of this is that if you ask me what I do, um, without hesitation, I'll say architect. So I'm not quite sure what that says about uh, all of this, other than the fact that I really value the title. So all of our work is done from Hackney City Farm in East London. Uh, Liam suggested that we had uh, an office in Glasgow, which we did for all of about 48 hours until COVID hit, and we didn't employ the person that was going to get in there. But I'm hoping that we'll get up and running um, and have a Scottish base again soon. Um, so for the moment, all of our projects are run out of this uh, Hackney City Farm in East London. Uh, where the team kind of mingle with the sheep and the goats. And uh, I, well, I, I see kind of all of our work. I've re recently moved to the Kent coast um, from Bethnal Green, uh, where I've got a view of the sea. But it means that I'm working more remotely um, three days a week, which is a big change for the office. And I, I think this is the... You know, is is the same for working classes everywhere. Um, we're facing kind of obvious and massive change um, where COVID's brought about different working methods, and it's going to be interesting to see what that to see what that means for architecture, not just in offices and the way that people are working together, but also in pay structures, London centricity, and in the quality and quantity of the output of everyone's offices. So one of uh, Mies van der Rohe's guiding principles was that he was not aiming for his projects to be interesting, but to be good. And that is my fundamental job in Denison Works, where I need to find the clients for whom we can do good work. It's as simple as that. Although you find when you get into practice that building any building is hard, uh, never mind trying, trying to make it good. And from that, I was going to try and stake my claim as an, uh, and with an entry to the Guinness Book of Architectural Idioms, uh, with good as in the detail. So just as Mies borrowed, God is in the detail from the Greeks, and the great critics made it his. But I discovered uh, a mindfulness and shopping podcast that have used this first. So my kind of search for immortality goes on. So the one thing we always start with with our projects um, is a, a poetic response to our sites and to each brief. So this woodpecker's nest um, formed the basis of our thinking for a viewing tower at Inverview Garden for the National Trust for Scotland, where we wanted to create an architecture on the outside that didn't give a clue about the spaces within. As here in the nest, um, the small hip hole an entrance to the nest gives no clue as to the size and form uh, of the spaces within. So this creates an architecture of surprise, which is something that I hold dear. So the, the, the image of the nest gave rise to this tower, which contains within its lower reaches um, a bothy for artists um, to stay and do artist residency. Above that is a little studio within which they can make work. And above that, there's a double height gallery where the artists work and the public public mingle um, and art and landscape and the community kind of come together. And sitting just above that are two viewing levels, nesting eagles and owls that sit in the treetops in Inverview Garden. Um, sorry, before I go on from Inverview, the one... Um, 
uh, like many projects, this is one that um, taught us quite a tough lesson, um, particularly about how hard it is to realise good work. So I met Princess Anne on site um, at Andrew Yew Garden. She laid the foundation stone in late 2019. And the project was due on site the next week. And the day of the start on site, the client phoned to say they were postponing. Um, uh, that was that meant the project was going to be pushed to March 2020. Then COVID hit. Then the NTS lost a lot of revenue. And I think it probably means the death of the project. So you can get so close. Um, but projects continue to get away. Um, and I would say that this one uh, in particular has kind of sold us right. But anyway, so we try and find poetry and inspiration in unexpected places. Um, this farmer's sheds made from agricultural concrete with a concrete roof um, poured over a sheet damp proof membrane to create the enclosure, which is all stuck together with liber liberally uh, applied liquid tar. And it, these simple techniques are really about creating shelter for animals and for crops and are without aesthetic decision or education, but we think are extremely rich and have helped to give form to some of our best projects. Like this one, which is house number seven, uh, which we finished a while ago in the Isle of Tyree, but is a state, still a great of, uh, project for the office won a number of awards, including the Stephen Lawrence Prize and been published across the globe. Um, and it, I think it still sets a great example uh, of creating architecture that's inspired by its setting, something new, uh, but distinctly of its place. So another project for the NTS, um, and one that we hope will happen, um, is uh, based on a glade or a clearing in a forest. Um, the building's a gateway building um, for the King Cairn Gorms National Park at the Lynn of Dee, so not far down the road from here. And it's conceived as a clearing in the pine forest that marks the edge of the National Park. Square in plan, uh, the building house, houses a ranger's base, education spaces, a cafe, shop and toilets, but the real magic of the projects and the overhanging roof that creates shelter from any inclement weather. The form of the opening in the roof, mimicking the form of a nearby lock and is designed to bring all the weight, the, wet, the sorry, the rainwater to the centre of the plan to water this courtyard garden. And the, the garden is designed to contain specimen trees and plants found all across the park. So it's a kind of national park in miniature where the garden tells the story of the history of the landscape. And we think this is going to be a cracker. So, so far I've given you a bit of an insight into what our office is about, how we approach projects, and an indication that we seek what is good and not what is interesting. So I'm now going to take you through the history um, of our floating church project, which shows you a bit more about the process and is interesting for several reasons. So the project, quite like house number seven, has brought us numerous awards and international press, but it's also a boat, which I was amazed to hear caused several architects to question whether or not it's architecture. I think it's a good question, and I'd be interested to hear what all of you make of it at the end, but th there seems to be quite a consensus among the British architectural profession that architecture needs foundations. I'm not having that. So the Diocese of London set out a brief with this image on the cover to six architects in late 2016, including 6A and Carmody Grook, Doug and Morris as it was then, and ourselves. And the brief was for a new build um, barge to house a floating church for London. Um, the, the idea being that it's a kind of modern mission taking the church to um, new communities across London. And I got quite excited about this image because for many years I've been harbouring a desire to build it on the following. So her true ambition was to build something extraordinary and fine from glass and cast iron, glass laced with steel spun like a spider web. The idea danced around the periphery of her vision long enough to be clear. 
Roger attempted to make a sketch, it became di diminished, wooden and elegant. Sometimes in her dreams, she felt she discovered its form. But if she had, it was like an improperly fixed photograph, which fades when exposed to daylight. She was wise enough or foolish enough to believe that this did not matter and that form would present itself to her in the end. So this is the culmination of a book called Oscar and Lucinda by Peter Carey, in which they sail uh, glass and steel church um, up the river to bring uh, the church to the masses. So this was in my mind um, when we got the brief until I turned the page and realised that we had to get it through the Islington Tunnel. So uh, the ideas had to change a little. Um, so the, oh, sorry, hold on a second. So one of, the, one of the founding principles of the Church of England, which is the reason that I've got this slide up, is that they've got a desire to have a presence in every community. So in London, as I'm sure you know, social and economic migration is rife. So the church recognised that they needed to provide new church buildings, in particular in the developing East End of London. So very cleverly, and I think this is not always true of either architects or clients, they realised that these new communities were all linked by the London Canal Network. So the idea of a floating church was born as a mission for the 21st century. So the idea being that the church can build up a, a congregation in each of those locations over a period of five years and then move on to the next. So having started with Peter Carey's glass edifice and having my hopes dashed, we needed to find another idea that would give the client's desire to create a conspicuous presence on the towpath. So we thought camper van, but this may be not the most poetic response, so we look for something that might be more appropriate for the church. And the traditional organ bell worked. So our project was all about creating a joyous bit of architecture that can transform to give the presence that the church were after, while being able to close up and travel under the bridges that span the canal. Like all projects, and I alluded to architects needing to eat earlier, we started with lunch. And this was the place setting after we looked uh, to try and consolidate our ideas for the church. And I th think you can see that we have the essence of the whole project here. And I like to think it's an example of the importance of drawing. Not all drawings need to be presentation standard, but a few lines can communicate the intent of so much. And I think these sketches of the floating church are a good example of that. So this model was used early in the process to try and explain to our clients uh, the transformative quality of the bellows and what, uh, well, the tra transformative quality of the bellows would have in the interior of the church. And interestingly, this model, um, we used the transoms of the windows to, to suggest the cross, thinking that this wouldn't go far enough for the diocese in the representation of the church in the building, but we were wrong. The whole intention of the project from a diocese point of view was it should be without re religious symbolism to encourage more people to engage with the church in new ways. And as traditionally churches were designed to make you feel small, our, ours was uh, very specifically designed to make everyone feel seen. So part of design process for all projects is about accepting change. And we, we work very hard to distill projects down to a very simple diagram that will survive the rigors of the construction process. From planning to budget constraints and beyond, and this early render of the church is a good example of how to deal uh, with these compromises and how often they make projects stronger. So our initial design for the church was to have two bellows, one to the bow and one to the stern. But our client felt that it was going to be risky to pursue the two from a budgetary point of view. So we took this drawing off the studio wall and pinned up a sketch version with just one bellow. And after a week or so, the team got so used to it that um, it was hard to think how it could have looked better with the two. So I think if you're having problems with a project, I'd always recommend draw the changes and live, live with them for a while until they sink in. 
So collaboration is key to getting the right results and architecture after all is a service and we can't function without clients. So it's important to get on with them. For the church, we held a number of consultation sessions um, where we talked about the function of the vessel and marked out the interior of the boat with masking tape on the floor, which you can just about make out in this slide. So this allowed us to work at one-to-one -one scale and draw out the brief with the client to reach the point of signing off the proposals. And in this case, it was a very successful tactic um, to win our client's faith in the process and our concept. So given the multifunctional use of the church, the palette we developed was uh, chosen to be simple and well, to provide a simple and robust background for numerous activities that are going to take place on board. Material choice was very important to the office. And here it was more about the robustness and a creating of a calm interior and less about innovation that we show in a number of our other projects. Showing these multifunctional spaces was key early on as we sought to balance the interior spaces of the church within the confines of the dimensions of a barge that can still navigate the canal network. So the barge, uh, the finished vessel is just over 21 metres long and just under four metres wide. And this drawing shows the church set up for a service seating 45, 35 people with the final built version seating 40 comfortably. This layout shows a parent and toddler group uh, with space utilised for play in the children and the final layout for a large dinner. So since the vessel has been completed, this layout has been key to the success of the mission. The curate uh, that looks after the boat, who's a very handsome chap called Dave, um, runs a series of sessions based on the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous where the group has dinner and talks about spirituality. Interestingly, these sessions are key to the church building, the local congregation, but the process is less about God and more about shared experience. Sometimes complex design challenges can be described through very simple diagrams uh, or sketches as shown here. And we spend the majority of our consultation period with the client setting out and agreeing the functional spaces within the vessel. So the key was to ensure the main hall was as large as possible while allowing for an accessible part um, compliant loo and a kitchen and workspace, workspace that could serve the main hall. So access is a midship on both sides of the vessel, which allows the, the boat to dock anywhere along the canal network. The cross sections show how the boat sits in the water and starts at, end, at both the structure of the, vel the bellows sitting within the gutters on either side of the main space. That's the, the bellows sitting up in the gutters there. Um, but also the built-in the furniture that function as both seating and storage to maximise the flexibility of the main hall. The long section illustrates the main hall to the left with the 8.5 metre long roof raised to create the aisle type space with a parents and toddlers group uh, taking place in the main hall. Beyond that, you've got the entrance with the pop-up hatches, workspace beyond, and the diesel engine sitting in the stern. And you can see from this, I think, that the, the architecture of the boat is really in the pop-up roof rather than the styling of the boat, which is because we were very keen that the barge was of the language of the canal. Um, rather than an architectural statement on its, in its own right. And we wanted to let the roof do the talking. So we went to the interview for the job, and I think this is why we won it, um, with the boat builder Tux, who are based in this boatyard at Chatham Historic Dockyard. And one, one of the things about working in a wide variety of projects, which I like, is that we get to work in splendid places, and this cathedral of industry is certainly one of them. Another pleasure of the job, uh, or in particular this job, was to see some of the crafts um, that have been lost to the architecture profession over the years. So these pen and ink drawings of the boat were drawn by the naval architect, who was another key member of our team. And the full, boat, the full boat was drawn and designed over a series of five A0 sheets. Um, and these now are a kind of cherished artifact 
an, an important part of our office archive. So the drawings were translated in the boatyard into the steel, the steel superstructure, which you can see emerging here. You can start to see the profile of the gutters uh, on the tops of either side of the skin, the skin of the hull. Um, and these set a slight camber to ensure drainage um, run and any runoff water runs down the side of the vessel. And it, these steel plates are measured and cut by hand. So there's there's a margin of error in here that made our work on the interior a little bit more challenging than it might have been. And I think we are used to, and I'm sure you are, um, working probably rather pointlessly to points of a millimetre in our CAD drawings. But the, build, the, the boat building industry, at least uh, at this scale, doesn't worry too much about that. But it made the process of us developing the interior much more complicated. A major technical issue that needed resolving during the construction was the mechanics needed uh, to open the aluminium roof. And it, this drawing is one of the first iterations by the naval architect, um, which was a kind of hinge system which would have required two members of crew, one to push the button to open the roof and one to come out onto the bow and place the stanchion uh, to brace the roof. And uh, this was one of the things that we, you know, kind of realised um, it's, a, it's a, a, a building or a boat that needed to function. It needed to be opened by one person and we needed to find a simple solution to the problem. So rather than reinventing the wheel, we looked to existing technologies, uh, which is something we often do. And in particular here to those of the tipper truck where large loads are lifted time and again with the simple hydraulic rams. And it, this proved to be the right solution for the, the vessel. Um, and it was engineered so that these sit either side of um, the fire escape and are tucked into the skin of the boat, which give a very kind of utilitarian solution. There's very little potential for technical problems and it's going to last a very long time. So the roof itself was delivered uh, onto site in one piece, uh, basically sat on the back of a loader around this uh, steel uh, skeleton structure. And it, this image starts to give you a real sense of the scale of the boat and an insight into the technical challenges presented in both the manufacture and the delivery of the boat. And it, this included the manufacture of the two meter diameter roof light, there was a late addition to the design. And it, we find um, in general, I don't know if your tutors would sign up to this, but additions, changes, uh, and sometimes omissions can really make projects um, when you see the final uh, results. And I, I think you'll agree when you see the Oculus um, in some of the later photographs, it's a real contributor to the success of the final project. And as architects, I think it's important to be alive to the opportunity for change throughout the process. So the last major technical challenge for the project was the translucent bellows. And if this project is innovative in any way, uh, then it is in the bellows. And you're the, well, it's in the bellows that you'll find new thinking. And we looked to England's oldest sailmakers to help us try and resolve the design. And we find during projects, you'll often find people say yes and hope that they can work it out later. And when you can compare these first drawings of the solution for the, the bellows from the, sa the sailmakers on the next slide, it should give you a sense of the challenges we face together. So after numerous iterations and a lot of input from our team, this detailed drawing shows the final resolution of the bellows, which shows a two skin concertina um, bellows uh, with reinforced polycarbonate fins that sit between each of the chambers and all fixed together with aluminium sail track that fold down into those gutters that then drain off the side of the boat that I showed earlier. And it, in this drawing, you can also see the bracing posts, um, which are actually curved in elevation when you see uh, the boat from the side and they slide down within the piers of the main space and prevent any windage from 
um, blowing the roof off um, because crosswinds in a canal are very, very strong. So this is the high tech translucent sailcloth that was used in the final bellows with a zigzagged um, hand stitch stitching, uh, which is a traditional sail stitch. And it's actually a pattern that we use throughout the boat that you'll see in some of the coming slides. And our sailmaker initially just added these um, as a kind of flourish uh, to make the sample look more appealing. Uh, and I think was surprised and maybe, maybe kicking himself a little when we said we wanted all of the stitching in this way, meaning that none of it was able to be done in a machine. So this is the first bellow chamber being um, constructed at the sailmakers just outside Leicester. And I, I don't know if you can make out in this photo, but the, the floor um, of the sailmakers workshop, uh, all of these people are actually standing up at table height and the seamstresses all crawl down on all fours every morning, not very dignified and climb up through a holes in the floor so that they're able to stitch pure runs of up to 20 meters of sailcloth at once. Um, it's a kind of amazing place, I think. Um, so we made a series of uh, prototypes for the final construction of the bellows, and this one shows um, uh, the testing of the polycarbonate ribs, and you start to get an idea of the quality of light that comes through the translucent fabric. We signed this off in a car park um, of a of beef eater, just somewhere out, outside the Norfolk Broads. So don't listen to anyone who suggests that we don't live glamorous lives. And the final one, uh, where again, a team suggestion kind of improved the final product. So we collaborated with Arab Lighting to come up with a solution to light the bellows. And they suggested that rather than the up lighters, which we'd been proposing, that actually we run LED strips through each of the chambers of the bellows um, and managed to make that work within the budget that we had. And it, it completely kind of transformed the quality of the final scheme. Um, so I think it's a kind of example of good uh, being in the details and where being open-minded can end up with great results. Um, if you remember the sail stitching from earlier, you recognize this pattern, uh, the zigzag pattern, but this time it's used for the the, the decoration to the, the privacy screens that we designed, which dropped down over the windows to the main hall. Um, and it kind of in general, our work stems from a, an understanding of history. And we use that to give us kind of inspiration for final details that help make a kind of each project a more cohesive whole. So we like to that the pattern here resembles the ancient Egyptian symbol for water. And again, it's a subtle, a subtle reference that enriches the project. So the finished article, this is Genesis, as she's known, sitting in its first home outside here east in Hackney Wick. And as you can see, the boat is unassuming in its close position, designed to fit in with the architecture of canals and barges. And you can also can see the kind of our take um, or continuation of the kind of zigzag motif um, from the sail stitching, which forms a frieze around the, the front of the roof and kind of symbolizes uh, or, or, or marks the opening portion of the roof. And of the colors, again, we didn't want to make too much of a statement of these, so chose colors from a standard maritime swatch book. Um, all of which was uh, to have the idea that we ensured that the, the building or the, the boat was welcomed um, into the boating community. Sip. Is everyone all right? You're all very quiet. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, I should have built up the tension for that slide. Um, so, and it, that's the opening of the roof um, where you see for the first time the architecture for, of the project and the kind of conspicuous presence uh, that was so fundamental to the brief. 
Um, the roof actually has been a great advert for the church um, and works as a, a signpost to let passers by know that the church is open for business. It acts as a conversation starter, and Dave, the curate, has found this uh, really been a great asset um, for him as he builds up a congregation, and he's already got a few members that have used the roof as a kind of icebreaker to start a conversation which has led to them attending some of the dinners that are based on the 12 steps. We've found, particularly given the, the last couple of years that we've had, that um, people are looking more and more for spiritual guidance in their lives. And there's a feeling um, of light in the bellows, creating a lantern in the water that acts as a kind of marker for um, the kind of help towards enlightenment. So this is the entrance um, after you descend down at midship, and I think it's my favourite photograph of the project. The dark black Valchromat walls create a threshold um, to the light interior of the main hall. Obviously, this is a set up for service, and therefore the vessel is most formal. But I think there's a real feeling of the hall being welcoming and being a space that people want to experience and will feel comfortable in. And the main hall with the roof up, and the quality of light in the space uh, through the bellows is kind of magical. Um, and um, here you can see the real force of the circular roof light that I talked about earlier. Um, and it brings light right down onto the face of Dave during his services, depending on which way the boat is facing and the time of day. Um, and talking about light, I think it's interesting in the context of this project, which is very different from our, our usual projects, because we usually start with context. We usually start thinking about views. We think about the position of the sun. And with a project that moves like this, we have none of these kind of hooks to start with. So conceptually, we kind of sort, thought about the project um, more as if we were designing a product or an object than a building. Uh, also in this slide, I like to the kind of quality of the altar, the, the sculptural quality of it, um, which is uh, designed to kind of be reminiscent of the prow of a ship, but made of, um, to fold away, to be stored in the cupboards, which you can just about make out on either sides of the altar there. Um, and in addition to the altar, uh, which are stored in those cupboards. Um, there's also these bespoke stools and tables made for the space. Um, and this was a project that really we could have designed alone and designed all of it ourselves. And we thought, though, that it was good to give the opportunity to a, a, a local fledgling business. In this case, it was two architects who just turned to um, furniture design, and we wanted to work with them to create these bespoke fold-away furniture, which stack away in the, the cupboards that I showed you a second ago. And on the right is one of those tables, um, and on the left is stacking stools. And again, part of the brief to the furniture designer was to take that zigzag pattern. So there's a kind of thread that runs through all of the elements um, in the project. Good is in the details. Um, here's one of the plywood columns with the ply facing, um, which is designed to kind of add a texture to the depth of the reveals to the window and to contrast with the very sort of clinical, clean aluminium of the privacy screens. And it, this photo also starts to give a sense of the quality of the light that comes from the project, most of which comes from it sitting on the water and you often get the light Kind of playing off the water and running across the ceiling um, of the main space um, and animating it and kind of adding to the sense of calm. Viewed from the outside, you see the motifs coming together with the zigzag of the bellows, the stitching of them, the frieze and the screens of the windows. Sorry, the language of the boat, as I've said, um, is of the canal rather than being high architecture. And I, I like to think that our office is confident enough to, to live with this kind of approach where intervention doesn't need to be absolute, but where but there is opportunity to create joy within existing settings. 
So the realization of a concept, this image was used uh, at the fundraising stage of the project and shows the vessel at dusk with the bellows lit to attract the community to come and converse with the church. And a photo of Genesis in position at a similar time of day. And we think the concept stands up pretty well. Now, I've taken you through a bit of an introduction to our office uh, and our work through the church. Um, and I hope it's kind of given you a bit of insight into the process of making good work. Um, the next bit, I'm just going to take uh, you through a couple of houses, one of which is nearly complete, um, but they're of a very different order. And it's really to just give you an idea of how our office continues to emerge. So Manor House on Tyree is our sec difficult second album, which is a new built house on uh, the southwest end of Tyree, as opposed to uh, house number seven, which sits more in the middle of the island, and it's inserted into this ruined barn structure. This is one of the photos of the existing condition when we started the project, with the gable form becoming an integral part of the design. The house is designed so that you approach through the heavy solid mass of the stone buyer into the house and the complex, sorry, the climax of the spatial journey is where you're confronted with a duplicate of this gable uh, and in particular this form um, only this time in glass. So I'm chairing this year's RIS Awards jury, and we've been through the shortlisting process. I think it was just published uh, yesterday, and I'm looking forward to the visits later in the month. But it's made me think about the importance of uh, the quality of photograph and photographs and selling one's work. This is Mano House uh, a couple of weeks ago when I'd been promised um, by the contractor that the house was complete and ready to photograph. And I don't mind telling you that having traveled up from Kent with our photographer, I was on the verge of tears when I opened the door. Um, but Gilbert McGarricker, who is the photographer, rallied uh, and managed to get me to pull myself together. So I'm going to show you a few of the images that we managed to capture. So this is kind of an exclusive. Um, so the courtyard, which acts as the entrance of the house, the walls here were entirely rebuilt um, with simple openings formed from be beams sourced on the island from old pier stanchions. And the stonework um, is absolutely immaculate. And again, this is a kind of lesson, I think, where allowing space for those that know what they're doing pays dividends. Um, so here the stonemason had an outline of the existing buyer, buyer form to follow and we ended up with something that was way beyond my expectations. And a view from the northeast on the beach shows the house looming on the horizon. And you see for the first time, the two gables uh, together, the glass reflecting the early morning light and the stone gable, uh, which forms the entrance courtyard to the right. Sitting or looming, depending on your point of view, above the stone wall is the same volume of the buyer lifted a story to create a double height living space. So the main living space with the glass gable and views out to sea gives the impression of being in the prow of a ship. Uh, and it's really, an, it's an incredible space to sit and to watch the changing tides and incoming weather. The space is almost church-like we think, and in our opinion, really uplifting. And it, what I hope is clear from this photograph is the difference a good photographer can make uh, to first impressions of a project. Um, and a great light streaming across the floor here too. And this is a close up to the same view, framing the incoming sea. Um, and uh, I don't know, another cracker, I think that photo. Upstairs in the master bedroom, you look through the main double height space uh, the ribs um, of the living room and then out to the sea beyond. And it, this image also makes sense of the little square window that's placed to frame the horizon from upstairs. Um, and this slight, slightly kind of off kilter element is something that we like to run through our projects to try and create a sense of, 
of kind of constant delight because um, we find that the unusual can create a sense of kind of ever-changing enjoyment of a project, even if it's in your own house. Um, and in this, I love the, the reflection of the landscape behind you. And the last view of the courtyard entrance, where we framed a view out to Heinish Pier and the lighthouse cottages beyond. Um, and again, I think a really evocative image and not a bad view to be faced with every time you come home from work. And a killer to finish with. Um, I don't really need to talk about that photo. I think I, I love it. Um, and this is one last project uh, to leave you with, which is a new house that we've just completed overlooking Loch Haw, in the west of Scotland, which sits in a site of just over 100 acres. This isn't it. Um, but our client did come with this scheme to our first meeting and say that this is what he wanted. Um, the meeting didn't go that well, um, but it was in late 2014. Um, so it was a project with a very long gestation period, but it was important to take the time so that we could make a project that was entirely autobi autobiographical and more suited to this epoch. So from the starting point of the kind of baronial pile on the previous page, we took the client through the history of Scottish, of the Scottish country home from Brocks to Macintosh, but we also looked at more abstract influences like the sculptures of Chilida shown here, and to try and work together to create a more sculptural response to the site. So this Chilida plus the section of the Tower House, house, tower house to the left there was kind of pivotal to the realization of the house where the scale of the spaces and the use of the internal rooms are hidden from the outside, which leads to numerous surprises as you move through the house and should be a source of kind of constant delight for the family. So like the boat, we were looking to work with a very simple material palette and one that was of its place. So shown here are natural materials utilized throughout the project, copper sheeting, wrought iron stud work to natural doors, with anodized windows. And on the left hand side, there is a big innovation in the project, which is the pebble dash render, which covers the whole exterior. Um, our client made it very clear from the beginning of the project that they didn't like television. So we clad the whole building in recycled TV screens. Um, <laughs> So that's the material on the left, which sits in the grey render, uh, the grey render substrate, which is a dark grey, but almost like a dark and stormy Scottish sky. as a glass aggregate um, used in different grades to give relief to the elevations, all made from recycled TV screens. Um, so not a professional photograph, but a preview of, or a kind of taster of what's to come. This is a photo of the bedroom wing, hunkered down into the landscape with the pebble dash in the different grades, which gives different access, accent to the building. Um, I love the way that the orange uh, windows here, um, which actually comes reflected off some of the copper fittings in the bathroom, gives a kind of constant look of the golden art to some of the rooms. Um, and we're excited about this one, I think. Um, but looking towards the living room, I think you start to get a real sense of the house as a bit of sculpture, where the openings are of different scales on the ground floor, sliding doors out to what will be a south facing seating area, and the, the first floor um, openings, which remain unglazed to a first floor terrace, which is complete with an outdoor fireplace and views across the loch, which is out. Uh, to the left of the image there. And we'll leave this project with a picture sent um, by our client uh, to us on Christmas Day, which kind of tells the story of the project, which is um, that one of the central tenets of the brief was he wanted space for an 18 foot Christmas tree. So we designed the house around the central hall, which just over six meters high uh, and arranged all of the functions around it. But it's, I, it's kind of difficult to get a sense of scale from the photo, but it's a great space, we think. So, there you have it. Some of our work and some of our workings.
Um, and I hope it was intriguing enough of you all, for you all to have some questions. And for those paying attention or wondering how they get the pair in there, this is how they do it. Magic. Thank you.